Good evening, Gaspel Baptist. It is good for you to tune in. I'm glad that you are. It encourages the work that we do here. I hope that this is helping you. Uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to leave some word of prayer. We'll be in Luke chapter 8 tonight, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for tonight. I ask that you will guard your word and let your word go forth in power and in truth. And Lord, uh, again, Help us to be responsive to your word. We don't want to be forgetful hearers where we hear it and we just go on, oh well, no big deal. We want to be faithful doers of your word, Father, because that's how we grow. And so, Father, remove those things from our hearts and minds right now that would keep us from doing that. Again, we thank you for all your protection so far for our church, our church families, our extended families. Uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, the day you've given us today and Lord, uh, uh, for the blessings of liberty and of freedom. And I just ask that you'll be with uh, our Christian brothers and sisters around the world, many of whom we will not meet this side of heaven, who are suffering simply for calling on the name of Jesus. Many are sick with this COVID. Many are not getting the attention they deserve just simply because they're Christians. And Father, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, would you just stop it? Would you just gain glory from it? Not the vaccines or any uh, person but you. And Father, most of all, would you stir uh, people's hearts and would you stir my heart and others' hearts and let us experience revival worldwide and draw us back to you in a closer way. That's the hope for our society. That's the hope for our world. And Lord, we know it's your will that many would be saved. And so, Father, uh, you just accomplish it as only you can by the power of your Spirit. And guide us again into your Word. In Christ's name, amen. In Luke chapter 8, uh, it starts off talking about some of the ladies who followed Christ after they uh, had come to believe who he was. And then in, in verse 4, he gives us a parable. It's the parable of the soils and the sower. And... Uh, so it'll be familiar, but I just wanted to look at it to remind us again some of the things that are involved in, in the work of, of uh, evangelism, in the work of sharing uh, the good news of the gospel, in the work of spreading the gospel and the kingdom of God, which is our job. It says, And a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, and he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell uh, by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it out. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The word there means to listen carefully, to pay attention. Then his disciples asked, saying, What does this parable mean? And he says, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it has been given in parables, uh, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and they have no root and believe for a little while, and in a time of tribulation or temptation, they fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those, when they have heard, go out, and they are choked with the cares, the riches, and the pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Now I'm going to also read in Matthew chapter 13 uh, this parable. Just a few more details. They're not, in con they're not in conflict at all. It's just I think each biblical writer remembers and the Holy Spirit brings their memory and you get a, a, a richer picture. It's sort of like some people add salt, some people don't add salt, whatever, uh, to the recipe. In, in Matthew 13, Begin verse 4, Then he spoke many things to him in peril, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. 
Some fell among stony places where they did not have much earth, and immediately they sprang up. Uh, but because they had no depth of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell among good ground and yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, and there's that word hear again, it means pay attention, listen co closely, let him hear. And the disciples came and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more be given, who have in abundance, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And the Isaiah the prophet fulfilled with this, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Again, when he says those things, it's not God's fault, it's their willful rebellion, their willful rejection of the truth of Jesus. And then when they ask him uh, what the parable's about, he says, Therefore hear the parable of the sword. When anyone hears the word of God or the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches it away or is sown his heart that he may receive the seed by the wayside. And he who received the seed in sorry pencils, this is the one who hears the word immediately, receives with joy, yet is no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he received the seed and the thorns as he who hears the word of God, the cares of this world, the deceitful of richness, choke out the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on good ground is the one who understands it and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. Several things I wanted us to know about this parable. Uh, it's sort of uh, like this. How, how do we get people to listen uh, to the word of God. How do we get them to understand? We, we, we don't understand why they wouldn't accept Jesus. We don't understand why uh, they would willfully reject Christ. And sometimes it frustrates, uh, frustrates us. Sometimes it discourages us. It's sort of like a salesman. And he kept getting in to see this guy. And this guy, he'd have an appointment. The guy would change it. And he'd have an appointment. The guy wouldn't show up. And, and he was frustrated because he knew his product was better than what the company was using. It was cheaper than what the company was using. And this guy to make a, a, a promotion needed to start using his product. And finally, in a moment of desperation, sort of an insight uh, uh, of genius, before he uh, flew back uh, to his hometown, uh, he took out one of those little things that you... You, the insurance, so if you crash, somebody gets the money. And he took out a big policy, over $100,000, and he wrote this, this guy's name as a beneficiary. And with the card that he, he mailed it to him, he said, my last thoughts were of you. Well, that's quite an inspiration because the guy was interested enough that he finally listened to his pitch and he became his customer. And it did help him get the next level of promotion because he was saving the company money and they were having good results with the new product. And sometimes we have to get creative like that. But I want us to understand uh, some things. It's not our job and it's not our responsibility to save someone. That's God's job. Only He can do it. But our responsibility is uh, being faithful to spread the gospel. My responsibility, your responsibility, our responsibility is to share the truth about Jesus Christ. That he is the only way to salvation. That he lived a perfect life. That he died on the cross for my sin and for your sin. Our sin. That he was buried three days. That he rose from the dead. And one day he's coming back. And that's the gospel in a nutshell. But you need to understand that in order to do that, you have to repent of your sins. Okay, which means you realize you're a sinner. And there's no other hope but Jesus. And you place your faith in him. That's the way you confess your sins and you place your faith in Christ. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. And so I wanted to look at this. This parable uh, tells us two or three things about spreading the seed. The first one is this. Notice the soil's response to the seed. Jesus gives us four types of soils. The soil here represents people, people. All right. And the seed, we're told, is the word of God. There's nothing wrong with the seed. All right. Uh, the problem's in the soil. He said, some are by the wayside in verse 5 of, of, of Luke chapter uh, 8. Some are by the wayside and the seed hits it 
And before it can take root, uh, the birds of the air, or the devil, snatches away so they won't believe. In that day, uh, the fields would be, uh, you would walk around the edges of the field. You wouldn't walk through somebody's middle of somebody's field. And the edges were hard from somebody always walking. And they would plow right up to the edge of their field. And then after they plowed, then they would scatter seed by hand. And they would sling it in a circular motion. If you ever uh, had to plant seed like that, like for a yard or, or maybe some uh, garden space or something. But it, it, you just sling it and it just scatters out. And some would either be blown over to the hard path or it would go too far and it hit the hard path but it was so hard it hadn't been uh, plowed it hadn't been cultivated and it wouldn't take root and the birds of the air would really swoop down and eat it and birds usually in the old testament and in the new would represent something evil all right and that'd be the devil the devil wants to snatch that seed up he does not want people to be saved but these people really are the ones who have deaf ears and cold hearts. I think they represent a lot of the Jewish leaders. They could see the miracles. They could hear the words of God. It had been explained in a way it had never been explained before. But they absolutely refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. With all the miracles that pointed that only the Messiah could do this. And they absolutely refused and called him a devil. All right? That's those people. They're the hard path. Uh, in my day, growing up, they were the stumps. Every revival we would visit them. Every revival we would witness them. Every revival we would pray for them. And sometimes we'd pray all year for them, for the coming revival. But they would absolutely refuse to either hear and refuse to believe. Then they say there's rocky ground in verse 6. The rocky ground, if you live here where we live, uh, you understand that a lot of our ground has that shelf rock right underneath it. And what that represents is you might have just a little bit of soil and you don't see it till you go to try to dig in it. And then you hit it. And the little bit of dirt there is not enough soil for the seed to really take root. So it's very shallow. And when the sun comes up, it'll cause it to grow. But as the sun gets hot, and really hot as it later in the season gets, it withers and dies because there's no root in itself. Now, these are the good time Charlies. They're superficial Christians. They're by Christian by mouth only. They're not really believers. And neither were those that, obviously, that the hard path. These are the people who, who are around, but if they encounter trouble or if they encounter tribulation, they fall away. They made a profession here, but it never was from here. It was not a commitment, all right? And it's the rocky ground. And then we have those that fall among the thorns. I think that's a majority of people. Uh, they listen to some of the claims of Christ. They're interested in the claims of Christ. But, you know, the old timers used to say the proof of a pie is in the pudding. Okay, you can have a really good crust on a pie, but if the pudding's not good, it's lumpy, it tastes bad, maybe to get mixed properly. How did the pudding set for that pie? And... They don't bring any fruit. It says the thorns come up, the weeds, the briars, all right? And it chokes out the life of the plant. They don't, you know, they may look good for a minute, but they don't produce fruit. You see, Jesus repeatedly said, you'll know them by their fruit. If they're really mine, they'll produce fruit. And the last kind of soil, the fourth kind of soil, was the good ground. It was good ground. It had been plowed up. It received it. It had the nutrients in it, and it produced a crop. Now, there's a difference in Matthew, the way he says it, the way Luke says it. Luke says it produced a hundredfold. It means super abundant. And then Matthew says a hundredfold and some 60 and some 30. In other words, some Christians are a little more faithful, but, but they do produce fruit. You understand? That was the only difference that I really see in that. It doesn't mean one's wrong and one's right. You need to understand that the average uh, increase, if you had a 20% increase over what you sowed, you had a tremendous crop in that day. A 10% was probably a really good crop. So to say you had a 100-fold or 30-fold or 60-fold, you were rolling in the dough. You were the best farmer in the county. But see, these people... Uh, had heard it, and the Holy Spirit had come to reside in them, and they produced fruit. They told others about Jesus, about their relationship with Jesus. They spread the seed. They 
one produces two, two produces four, four produces eight, eight produces, you, you get the, the hint there, you just keep on doubling, and you, you, you finally it's exponential growth. And that's the kind of growth that the kingdom of God is supposed to have. There's a church in Glendale Springs, North Carolina. It has murals on the wall. One of them is the Lord's Supper. And the most striking thing about that is that the way the artist painted it, you know that it's Jesus sitting there with his hands pointed towards an empty chair. It's our invitation to come to him. And we have to decide that. Some of you sitting don't know about these soils and the seed. You need to understand that, that you've heard the gospel, but you've let Satan snatch it away so it won't have any effect. You've hardened your heart. You've told God no so many times. You don't want to hear it anymore. We need to ask, are you in that category? Some have some kind of super uh, official commitment, you know. It's a good time thing, but if things don't go just your way, God's not for you, and you're not having anything to do with it. Shame on you. And some need to get the sin out of your life. You're so worldly that that people couldn't tell you as a Christian. There's weeds, there's briars, there's thorns. Now, I'm not trying to judge you, but have you produced fruit? If I haven't produced fruit and you haven't produced fruit, there's something wrong with our conversion. We were never converted. And some, we know them, they have the uh, smile of God, the, the shine of God in their lives. They, you look and you can see the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, peace, gentleness. You can just see it all over them. And they're telling others that their happiness, their, their blessings come straight from God, that they're God's person and there's no doubt about it. You know it. When you hear them talk, they're just different in a very good way. So the only question is, if you were to examine your life, what kind of soil are you? What have we done with Jesus? And are we sharing the seed? Are we just scattering it? And then God's responsible for the results. Are we just trying to carry the seed in our bag till we get home? Because we're afraid of offending somebody. Then, that's the second one. That's the soil's response to the seed. The second point would be the sower's responsibility to the seed. Now the sower is a believer, a Christian. And the seed again is the word of God. And he gives us maybe some some uh, results of sowing, some, uh, uh, I don't know how else to call it, rewards for, for faithful sowing. Uh, the first one, he talks about our position. See, when the sower is faithful in spreading the word of God, he positions himself in the will of God. Do you hear that? When we share the word of God like we're supposed to about Jesus, when we're his witnesses, when we're light and salt in our world, we position ourselves in the very center of the will of God. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9 says, God is not slack concerning his promises, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, God doesn't want people uh, to die without Jesus. Some will, but it's their fault. They reject. All right? And uh, millions do that each year. And we need, you know, I've had people say, I'm not responsible for those. No, maybe not for the millions, but we are responsible for those in our path. A couple of scriptures. We begin with Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1. Please hear me. Again, the word of God came to saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their torture and make him their watchman, and when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own hand, head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, did not take the warning. His blood shall be on himself. But he who takes the warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die, and you not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall, shall die in his iniquity, but his blood 
our choir at your hand. We are responsible for our brother. And then also in Ezekiel, chapter 22, verse 30. He's talking about the people's sins. And in verse 30, he says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I poured out my indignation on them, my anger on them. A couple of things that we need to understand. We are responsible for spreading the seed. I'm not responsible for the results. But if I don't warn people, hey, there's a real place called hell. Hey, without Jesus Christ, you go to hell. And if I don't warn them and I don't spread that seed, but I've had the opportunity, I know this person, I haven't shared the gospel with them, then that blood is required at my hand when they die of their own iniquity. That's a scary thing to stand before God and say, I didn't do it. It's not my gift. I didn't do it. I didn't feel responsible. You had... We had a preacher to do that. We had a youth pastor to do that. We had deacons to do that. We're responsible. Now, we need to understand that. That we're called to be watchmen. That we're called to share God's word. That we are responsible for those around us. <clears throat> so, that's our position. God wants them saved. We give them the opportunity to be saved. The Holy Spirit works on them. And some will be saved. Others will not, but that's not my responsibility. Pastor I had in college, uh, Nick Garland, wonderful man. I remember going witnessing to him on a time or two, and he always ended his witnessing with the same warning. He would say da -da -da, and call the person's name. I've explained everything you need to know about Jesus. I've explained to you how to be forgiven of your sins and to be saved, to be rightly related with God. And you're telling me you don't want to do that. And I accept that. I'm not going to bug you about it. But I want you to understand, from now on, you're not my responsibility. I did what God told me to do. If you die tonight, it's your fault when you end up in hell. And that would end the conversation pretty much. Some people got mad. Some people had a scared look. Some people say, well, let's talk about this a little bit more. And he didn't do it to scare anybody. He just wanted them to know he had fulfilled his duty according to the Holy Spirit of sharing the gospel. They had rejected. Now it was on their head, not his head. That's what we need to remember. We position ourselves in the very will of God when we share the gospel. But then we also experience the peace and presence of God in sharing the gospel. When the sower is faithful in spreading God's word, he enjoys the peace and presence of God. You see, when we do this, the peace is based on the not based on the result, it's based on our faithfulness. Ezekiel 3.19, again, our responsibility is to sow. The Holy Spirit takes care of the rest. Okay? See, the promise is, is this. And that's the third thing, the promise. The sower who is faithful will be rewarded. In Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping and bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The Bible also says uh, in uh, the book of Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Okay? Uh, James chapter uh, 5 verse 20 says, Let him... Know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. We position ourselves in having the peace and presence of God in our lives because we've done what we're supposed to faithfully do, which is share the word of God. Share about Jesus, our Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. Do we understand that? Uh, Elton Trubud, an evangelist of the last century, uh, had done a lot of history study. And when the, cake, when the Quakers first came uh, to America, he said it was amazing you could follow their path from Europe to the Americas because everywhere the boat would stop, 
They would get off and share everything they could about Jesus. And he said it was this. They left little fires going here, little fires going there, and little fires going there. All the way to the new world. Because they took responsibility that they knew Jesus and other folks didn't and needed to know. Now, do you want to be in the will of God? Do you realize most of those things says, Lo, I'll be with you always at the end of the age. Before that, he says, you'll be my witnesses to all the world. Okay. He gives us peace in this world, even though we'll have tribulation. He gives us His peace. And those things are as we share Him. Do we understand that? If we fail to spread the gospel, then we're failing in what God saved us for. And we need to ask, are we going to be empty-handed and not have our sheaves with Him? See, there is such thing as the crown of life and the crown of righteousness, and then another crown is the crown of the soul winner. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I sure do want one. See, there's going to be results if we faithfully spread because it's up to God. It's not up to me. I fail. And so, I wanted just to review just some lessons for us. The first thing I want you to know is that God is the one who's at work. We're just invited with Him. That, that's out of uh, <clears throat> Henry Blackaby's book, uh, Experiencing God. But uh, in, I got a couple of scriptures. John 6 44, Jesus reminds us, no one come to, come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. God's the one at work. We're just invited to get a chance to join in. In John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you these things I commanded you that you love one another. We need to understand that God's at work. We need to understand He's responsible for the results. Quit saying I might say the wrong thing. Quit saying I might offend somebody. I might drive somebody and be the cause of them going to hell. No. No. That's only if I make them stumble. That's when I cause them. Do you understand that? Uh, People are constantly asking me and trying to criticize and snicker and say, you're just being a preacher. And I tell them that they shouldn't be drinking. But the Bible doesn't say I can't drink. No, but the Bible says don't get drunk. But the reason I choose not to drink is twofold. I had a problem with it in high school. My, both my grandfathers were alcoholics and my dad was an alcoholic. And I had a problem with it. And when God got to convict me about my lifestyle, and I finally surrendered to Him and got right with Him, that was one of the things I had to give up because if I drank at all, one would never be enough. But the second reason is even more important. In the book of Corinthians, Paul talks about uh, not causing somebody to stumble. And if, if he's eating meat and it causes somebody to stumble, he'll, know, he'll be a vegetarian is basically what he says. Because some are stronger, some are weaker, and the stronger are not cause the weaker to stumble. And if somebody sees me out here doing something that they think is wrong for a pastor to do or for a Christian to do, it causes them to stumble. And then my witness is null and void and I cause them to stumble. And they may never accept Christ. Do we understand that? Now that's just one example. It might be overeating. It might be stealing. It might be uh, running around on your wife. It could be anything. But we're not to have that kind of lifestyle. We're to have a lifestyle that is winsome, that shows off the fruit of the Spirit, and that draws people as we're the light and the salt, and then we get to share Jesus, and they get to get saved. So God's at work. He's responsible for the results, and we're responsible for witnessing. I already uh, read that, to spread the seed, the good news of Jesus out of Ezekiel. We're the watchmen. We're the people who stand in the gap. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to upset a lot of people. The condition of our country that it's in right now. Are you ready for this? It's not the younger generation's fault. It's not the politician's fault because we are supposed to vote the way God would have us vote. And if we vote godly people in, we wouldn't be in this mess. Now I'm gonna get off of that away from politics and let us understand something. If we'd been witnessing and focusing on witnessing and focusing on sharing the gospel, our neighborhoods would be different. Our towns would be different. Our states would be different. The United States would be different. 
Do we understand the high point for evangelism was in the 50s for Southern Baptists and we've just gone like this? Because we've gotten involved in politics, we've gotten involved in, in money, we've gotten involved in all these things. And so for some reason, because of a lack of discipleship, for a lack of witnessing, the baptism have gone down. The discipleship shows up because, I'm going to be real honest, in most uh, households they have the same attitude as a lost world. Barner Group has proved that with every uh, five or six years they do another one to see what people believe in and don't believe in. And they can find hardly any discernible difference, not just between young people, but between the adults in homes that are claimed to be Christian and the adults in homes that don't have anything to do with God. Something's wrong with that. That means we're not spreading the gospel. They make some kind of profession, but it's not here. We need to share the real truth of how we're saved. The last lesson for us is we are blessed when we are abundant. Okay? Uh, we're to be bold enough that there's a 30-fold increase or a 60-fold increase or a 100-fold increase. Uh, we'll have joy as we come bringing our sheaves with them. It takes some weeping. When have we wept over somebody that has not accepted Christ and just continue to weep and join together and pray for that person privately by name until God moves and we get to share the gospel? That's what we're supposed to be about. So we have the seed, the soil's responsibility to it. We have the sower's responsibility to the seed and we have some lessons about God and how He works in our lives. For whatever reason, He chose to work through us to accomplish the kingdom work. Are we working? And are we keeping the main thing the main thing? Pray for our association, our church, our association, the state convention, the national convention, that we'll keep the same thing and God will bring revival to our land and to the world. Have a good evening. We love you. Call us if you need us.